before Deb, um, before Debbie does the uh, roll call, uh, I want to go ahead and say you have a packet in front of you. Um, it's it's confidential. It's some of our closed sessions. We'll uh, discuss it at the end of the meeting. But if you want to kind of flip through them throughout the meeting, go ahead and do so, and then we'll turn them all back into Debbie. Initial them and turn them into Debbie once um, at the end of the meeting before you leave. So. Um, all yours. Okay, we have Mayor Fulvogas. Present. Mayor Summers. Mayor Smith. Here. Christopher Walton. Mayor Marlin. Here. Mayor Alfu. Diane Michael. Present. Mayor Feynman. Here. Alicia Beck. Here. Patrick Brown. Here. Katina Walter. I'm here. And Kelly Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there approval of the agenda? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Oh, motion carries. Bless, Bless you. Bless you. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any? No. All right. Thank you. So, in your packet, there's the minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes for the March 22nd meeting? So moved, Michael. Uh, any discussion or questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, we'll move on to our consolidated financial reports. Um, so, Ryan is up there. Oh, there he is, because I'm like, I'm looking for Good morning, Orion. Hey, I'm hiding today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip. I know we talked uh, last month about the February financials, but those weren't officially approved. Um, they were just for discussion purposes. So those are on your uh, agenda this month in order to approve. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the April financials. Um, so if you're looking at those going from left to right, funds 104, 475, 474, uh, 060, and 110 have all remained relatively the same uh, comparing the last and their fund balance is, is well and remain relatively the same as far as uh, activity goes. Um, with 110, of course, you know, always running with a deficit due to just on a regular reimbursement basis. Um, the one notable uh, fund of change from February is Fund 109. Um, it's currently got a deficit at the end of April sitting at 1.2 million. Um, we had followed up with DCO, there was a bit of confusion on mainly DCO aside from where we submitted the payments in January, February, March um, for reimbursement and we had to uh, receive the checks back. Um, so we did follow up with them. That's been corrected and there was a check in the mail on May 20th for $885,000 and we should hopefully receive that here by the end of the get it received within May's financials. Um, if not, you'll, you'll probably see that deficit for a little bit in May and then I'm um, going to be received out here on financial instead. Um, one thing we are working with the DCO on now too is communication on getting set up for advanced payments for uh, ICERT moving forward um, with the ongoing discussions uh, with the RFP for the new ICERT facility. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, once there is a lot of cost going out the door, you know, related to the build out of that renovation of the building that we're ends up getting put out or selected. Um, want to make sure that we're not drawing down from uh, other operations um, to be able to, you know, basically handle that until we get the reimbursement. So, so yeah, we're looking to uh, advance payments going forward on that piece of it. Um, otherwise, I'll have down financials. Uh, any questions? No questions? No, I don't see any. So, um, Thank you, Orion. So, is there a motion to approve the consolidated financial reports for February, March, and April? So moved, Smith. Second. All right. Um, if there's no questions, then all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, would you go ahead and is there any, um, you want to go through the list of bills or? 
if there's any questions on those or any ones that you want to highlight. Uh, <laughs> I think you know where I go with this at this point. Yeah, so as far as list of bills, nothing unusual. Um, we, you know, felt like it has been ramped down, so, um, you know, you're going to see that activity go out the door here, and then after that, we get into June, and there's not going to be much in the way of a utility client assistance, um, other than a few supplemental grants that are going to be still operating. But, um, yeah, otherwise, there's, you know, if you've got questions, just let me know on the list of bills. All right, thank you. Um, is there a motion to accept, accept and place on file the list of bills for March and April? So moved, Michael. Second. All right, um, seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, um, we have our action items. Of, uh, first one is the approval. And Rita, do you want to go over those, the membership fees for um, 2025? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. You have on your back of the uh, memo regarding the proposed member membership fees for fiscal year 25. As you can see, uh, we are not proposing any increase to the multiplier and no changes on the population. Then uh, basically the fees are going to be the same fees you, that you pay for fiscal year 24. What we did was to adjust a little bit the scope of services in terms of hours for the different tasks based on the work that we have done in fiscal year 24 and based on recommendations from the RBC Technical Committee. They approve uh, the scope of services and the proposed fees uh, at their meeting in April. Any questions? Right. If there's uh, no questions on that, is there a motion to accept and place on file the membership fees? Approved. Approve. Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. All right. If there's no questions, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Um, the next item uh, for discussion is uh, our personnel policy manual and telework policy re revisions. And Tammy? Good morning. Um, you have a memo in your packet that goes over what these recommended changes are for the personnel policy and the telework policy. <coughs> so I will briefly go over those. The first one is conflict of interest. And we're recommending the change to the personnel policy in the conflict of interest section, essentially to ensure that employees are disclosing um, their employment relationship when, apply, when applying for benefits mm -hmm. so that we can be sure that we are um, maintaining their records in a manner that's in compliance with the program requirements. And some of those require um, confidentiality. Um, the second change to the personnel policy is regarding transportation expenses. Um, so there was a telework policy that was drafted um, during COVID, and we recently discovered there was a loophole between the telework policy and the personnel policy that allowed for employees whose um, main uh, work site was their home to be eligible to receive reimbursement for mileage when they commute to their traditional work site. So you know, we have some fully remote employees, we have some employees who are like hybrid, they work two days in the office, three days at home, and it was never intended when the telework policy was drafted for employees to receive mileage reimbursement when they have to come in and work um, from the traditional work site. So the recommendation is to basically um, provide clarification in the personnel policy uh, about that. I kind of got lost in the shuffle. So basically, we're going to pay them to come in to? No, okay. we're correcting the policy to make sure that they're not uh, okay. eligible to be paid. Okay, thank time. you. Yeah, I just got lost. Thanks. Um, the next change is uh, actually um, driven due to request from the county. Um, right now, our health insurance eligibility is uh, the, the first day of the month following the employee's hire day. And that has been problematic for the county because in, especially if an employee is hired at the end of the month, there's not enough time for them to turn the paperwork around and get them enrolled. So the county asked us to consider 
uh, revising the policy to allow for some more time for them to be able to process that. So we had discussions with the county, we had discussions internally, and determined that a 30-day um, eligibility period made the most sense. Um, it, it has a nominal impact on new employees. In some cases, it might not have any impact if you were hired at the very beginning of the month. Um, so that is uh, the recommended change for the health insurance um, eligibility. And the last uh, recommended change is the telework policy. And it is to provide clarification about um, when employees are traveling to from like the remote work site to their traditional work site, that they are not eligible to count that as time, worked time. So we just want to make sure that that's clear, um, that the commute from their home to um, work. And in most cases, you know, people know you don't get paid to drive to work, but where this kind of was a little bit um, gray was if an employee started their work day at home and then came in to the office like maybe for the afternoon. Um, we wanted to make sure that employees understood that they could not count those commute time um, times as work hours. Question. Jerry, you got a question. Oh. Um, yes, regarding the health insurance, I just want to make sure that I understand. So employees who are hired now have to wait 30 days before they're eligible, or not eligible, before they start receiving benefits? Yes. And you don't think that's going to be a negative impact on future hires? Well, I will say the county's um, eligibility period is 60 days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it's not as though other county employees aren't also having to wait. Um, I think, you know, it potentially will impact employees. You know, those who are hired at the um, end of the month mm -hmm. will have to wait that 30 days instead of being eligible immediately. But I don't think it's uncommon um, in government or, you know, even the private sector for people to have to have a uh, period of time where they're waiting before they're eligible for benefits. And the other thing I will also note is that, um, you know, there is that COBRA period that employees that are moving from their, their prior uh, employer would also have that option. And my understanding is that, you know, if they, they have 60 days to trigger that. So let's say they moved, you know, to the Regional Planning Commission and they didn't take the COBRA but something happened and you know they were like oh my goodness i need health insurance they would be able to go back and enroll mm -hmm. in that cobra to you're themselves. absolutely correct i just i cobra is very expensive right it's and not it's, something that most employees can actually afford mm -hmm. um and so that it, that gives me pause to be honest with you um, i won't speak for any other organization but for the village you are eligible for benefits <coughs> on your first day of employment and if we're going to hire you, we go through that process and we make sure that when we give you a conditional offer, you pass your backgrounds and do all that fun stuff, and we give you a confirmation, we give you all your enrollment information, we answer your questions, and we make sure that we get that information submitted so that when you're on your first day, you have, you have your time. I'm not saying that you can't do that, and I'm not saying that the county can't do that, but it just it just gives me pause, to be honest, because it's it's such a change from what RPC has been doing. And, and I completely understand that you're dependent on the county for, for some of this, and so it, it makes sense to give them more time since they're the one processing, but um, you, you are correct about COBRA. Uh, I just, th that makes me feel a little uncomfortable, but that's just a personal standpoint on it. Yeah, but I understand, I understand from the organizational standpoint, it, it does seem to be the most practical sense, but I that, that seems a bit unfortunate. <clears throat> and I know that's not your within your control. <laughs> or yours. Yeah, we felt like, you know, this was a compromise that would yeah. nominally affect, yeah. you know, the employees and, and again, yeah. you know, won't affect any at all in some cases because if they are hired on the first or the second, they wouldn't have been eligible, right. you know, until the first of the following month anyway. Yeah. I would just I don't know what this means operationally for you, for you guys, and I'm sure you'll figure it out, but I, I would really just encourage RPC to be deliberate in when you're making those hires to see if, if it's operationally practical to be bringing people on board at a time when they're able to start and 
get their benefits. I mean, like I don't, I don't know how that would work, but I, I, I don't know. That I'll stop there. But it just seems odd. And actually, our bargaining unit staff were waiting longer yeah. than the rest of the yes. RPC. How many? Sixty days. Sixty days. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be okay. looking into revising that. So they're at thirty days. No, it was 90 days. It was, oh, it was, no, it was 90, 90 days. 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 What was worse? It was to 60, yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I'll just, I mean, I'm like, like Christopher, that's, you know, we're immediate and, and, but again, agreeing with you that it's a very common private sector as well as yes. government to have a wait period. You know, because that's like one of the first questions we get is, oh, immediately? It's like, yeah. And and we usually get a surprise that when we hire somebody, which isn't that often, that it's immediate upon hire. So. Mm -hmm. Often ma matches the probationary period. Yeah. Right. All right. If there's no other questions, sorry. Did, did you have a question? I, I think it might, it, it's important to also understand that, you know, people who come on to the organization that have to now wait the 30 days, they also have 45 days to pay all COBRA periods, or COBRA uh, that's due. So there's that 30 day period that if something ha did happen to them, you know, they could elect COBRA with the prior employer. So you're right. I, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. I, but I also know that in this very room, we've talked about how much we're paying our employees and what that looks like against market rates. Yes. And I, I don't have the confidence that we are paying people enough to then pay for COBRA on top of all of their other mm -hmm. obligations that they have without negatively impacting their financial you know, stability in the moment. And, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. It is very common. It's just it's uncommon for me that's why it gave me pause but you, you are correct and I think it does make sense for the organization to do that especially since you're administratively dependent on the county absolutely so, thank you yeah. okay um, do I hear a motion to accept and approve the <coughs> recommendation of the personnel policy so moved second Michael okay any additional discussion Right. If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. Motion carries. Next item, uh, Brandy, you have a, um, a bid for uh, Food for Head Start. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm recommending the acceptance of the food service bid from Cook Patterson to be very local and employed. This vendor is experienced serving meals to toddlers and preschoolers, and they have also made positive changes uh, to their workforce, but also their food quality. Um, this um, vendor used to be Marble's uh, food singles. Oh, um, yeah. So that you know, kind of jogs your memory a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it did change hands um, uh, several years ago. Uh, this vendor meets all requirements for public health and child, child adult care food program uh, for food service uh, to be licensed at the child care, um, child care centers. Uh, the unit price for preschool lunches is two ninety five, dollars which is a reduction of $1 from what we were paying Good. with the previous vendor. Um, and also the infants and toddler meals would be at two eighty five. dollars So again, that's a dollar change. Uh, the Urbana Center has 90 preschool ch age children and 16 infants and toddlers, and they um, we expect that uh, the total bid or the uh, total number of days and the additional um, uh, meals required by the Office of Head Start, um, you know, coincides with their their bid of $75,048. So I think this is very reasonable. Um, Head Start also, um, you know, we, we followed the CACFP and the RPC bid processes just to make sure that you are aware. This did happen in April, but we did not have a commissioner's meeting um, at the end of April, so that's why it's, it's to you um, this month. Um, the bid announcement did run for three Sundays, and um, it was also noted in the News Gazette, as well as our website, and we also delivered um, packages, bid packages to several local catering vendors within the county, but also outside the county. 
Um, however, despite our efforts um, to attract more bids, uh, we only received one from McPherson. But I, I do believe that with our historical experience with um, this, this vendor, I think that we should give them another try. All right. Is there a motion to uh, approve the food bid for Head Start? So moved. Okay. Second. Any questions? Discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right. Thank you, Brandy. All right. We have our um, division program division updates, and we'll start with um, Orion. So do you have a. Uh, the main update that I've got is submitted a draft of our uh, schedule of expenditures of federal awards to COA back on May 9th um, mm -hmm. related to the county's external audit. COA got back to us this week uh, with their selection for the single audit. Um, it looks like this year we're going to have the testing over the entire Department of Labor for the legal funding. Mm -hmm. We've got ARPA funding that's going to be tested from the Department of Treasury. And then we've also got the Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, they've selected uh, basically the CSD a cluster 93.568, which is our light heat and weatherization funding as well. Um, so we're starting to pull together all of the support and detail that makes up each one of those uh, programs. You know, go ahead and start dealing with CLA on their request, whoever to, to make them happy. So. Right. Thank, oh, you. Really <laughs> Thank you. Becky. Thank you so much. Good morning again. Included in your packet today is the personnel transaction report representing new hires, exits, and position reassignments from March 10th, 24 to May 4th, 24. The Human Resources Department has been focused on several staffing strategies to attract, motivate, and retain qualified staff. The management team is working strategically to fill 16 vacancies with Head Start, which is, has been our lowest, you know, vacancies for many years. So we're, we're getting really close. I've got two offers in the email now. So um, we have an opening with our indoor climate research and training program. And I understand uh, we're getting close to moving forward there, Paul. Um, data technology, planning, and community development and community services. Just have one or two positions. And I'm happy to report that workforce and administration divisions are fully staffed. We continue to experience positive trends with turnover. Uh, which is a blessing for all, right? Um, last year at this time, we experienced 27 exits, exits uh, while this year we are only at 12 have left the organization. As of April, our turnover rate has decreased from 11% to 5%. Um, if we can hold tight over the summer, um, where we experience typically our highest turnovers in May, May through the uh, Labor Day, um, you know, we have a really good chance of having an annual turnover rate under 30%, and uh, the entire team here uh, would have a tremendous accomplishment if that happened. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. We're hoping to get there. Um, on April 24th, RPC hosted an agency-wide employee recognition event for approximately 280 employees. Um, we had great fun that day. Um, we recognized employees with milestone anniversaries and Habib Habib, a local professional speaker, motivated the RPC team with a speech on finding joy and thriving during challenging times. Um, the afternoon session offered employees the opportunity to attend the elephant in the room training. Right, you guys want to know what that is? Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so that uh, training gave you know some really good tips on communication. Um, the UKG uh, Human Resources Information System implementation is moving along. We are currently, <coughs> excuse me, refining the recruitment and performance uh, module. The Head Start division is almost fully through their performance reviews through the new system, and so we're getting ready to start training the non-bargaining unit uh, managers, supervisors, and then employees to have reviews done by October 1st. 
We are also working on developing an in-house training module within the UKG system to execute our annual ADA and anti-harassment trainings. Um, we have been able to develop the UKG mod modules with the support of Tyler and the data technology team and the unique skill set of Bob Dorsey, our HR generalist, who we appreciate a lot. So thank you, Tyler, and um, everybody involved here. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. If there's no questions, we'll move on to Brandy. Red start. All right, good morning again. Um, uh, always included in your packet is a Head Start management report, but I really want to steer our focus on our, our um, staffing and also our enrollment. So I'm happy to report the staffing vacancies, as Becky mentioned, are close to being in the, sing in the single digits. Uh, if you include the applicants um, who have been offered positions, um, as Becky also said, um, but also participating in background checks. So, um, and I just received more background checks in my email this morning, so I'm really excited about that. Um, our program has gone from 68 vacancies, if you can remember, um, back in, um, what, uh, summer of 2023. And um, as Becky reported, we're we're now at, at number 16, so that's kind of fluctuated. I had 14 in my report, so, um, but that's that's exciting. Um, the increases in wages, I think, really helped our program to attract and retain our employees, um, and we've had very few uh, employees exit the program, so I'm really excited about that as well. Um, so I'm very thankful for everyone's support, including our HR, um, team and our managers and especially our employees we've had several employees reaching out to um, their friends and family and referring um, people to our program and to fill those vacancies so that's been really really exciting um, the reduction in staffing vacancies has also allowed the program to open the remaining classrooms so another milestone for us um, and that's at every center so really really um, proud of that um, and excited to keep moving forward. Um, as of the end of April, our child and pregnant women's enrollment has increased to 92% in Head Start, 85% in Early Head Start, and 86% in Early Head Start expansion. So we were back in the 50% range and lower, um, so back in what, fall and early winter. So I, that's huge, that's, those are big changes for us. The enrollment numbers for May will definitely show further increases as the family support team um, uh, has been very busy enrolling children and families and they've also been out recruiting in our community. Um, so I'm very anxious to report those numbers next month. Uh, the family support team, which consists of managers, advocates, mentors, and home visitors, um, have been highly instrumental in filling those vacancies. So very, very um, proud of their efforts. Um, if you remember, I applied to expand our service area to Vermilion, Ford, and Iroquois counties in December of 2023. I wanted to provide this for an update. Um, in April, I did receive a notice that the Office of Head Start was reviewing our application. However, we have not heard um, where we are in that process at this point. Um, it is, however, my understanding the Office of Head Start is behind in awarding grants, so I'm hoping we will know soon. Um, be on the lookout uh, for the Early Childhood Division at the Champaign County F uh, Freedom Celebration Parade on July 4th. We are hoping that we will have additional divisions joining um, us this year in the, in the parade lineup. Uh, this parade is a great opportunity uh, for our program to, you know, to promote who we are, but also um, promote our whole RPC organization. So I hope to see you all there. Uh, this concludes my report for this month. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Brandy. Is there any questions for Brandy then? If not, we will, let's see, Lisa's not here, so we'll move to Rita. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, staff continue to work on several projects, but I'm going to highlight a few of them. I'm going to start with the no range transportation plan 2050 that is due in December of this year. Uh, currently, we are working on the round two of public outreach. 
We have been at six of 16 events that we have planned this summer. Uh, we have collected uh, 243 surveys so far, and we are planning on closing round two by the end of July to have a draft document to present to you in September to get it approved by December. That's more or less the schedule. Uh, Yesterday at the Jamaica Board meeting, we got uh, approval of a resolution for providing service to the Illinois Center for Transportation. We got into an agreement with the University of Illinois College of Engineering to uh, provide services to students, faculty, and staff, and take them from the Champaign-Urbana area to run to uh, the contract is only for the summer, but our hope is to have the contract for the whole year, depending on the ridership. Um, this will allow uh, C-Cards to uh, get more federal funding that we are currently uh, returning back because we don't have enough local match to match the uh, federal allocation that we receive every year. Okay. Uh, Hopefully, we'll keep that contract going. Rita, can you speak to that a little bit more about what that ridership looks like? And do you know, um, is, will that just maintain the frequency of C-Cart, or will there be more frequency? Uh, regarding frequency, we will not be able to increase mm -hmm. the frequency for mm -hmm. two reasons. One is, uh, at this time, we are waiting for 12 buses to replace the current buses mm -hmm. that we have. Uh -huh. Uh, those buses are going over their uh, useful life, and we are using a lot of maintenance, uh, funding for maintenance of those buses to keep those buses running. Uh -huh. That's the first limitation. The second limitation is this is the route that we have between Champaign Urbana and Ratul, and from Ratul back. Right. Then uh, that's a route that we have had in place since uh, we started the contract with the village of Rantoul uh, for the service uh, within Rantoul. But uh, the service is only from 5 in the morning to 9 in the morning, mm -hmm. and from 3 in the afternoon to 6 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And the buses that we have are 40 passenger buses. Mm -hmm. Then. Uh, in order for us to add or extend the service, <laughs> we will need a lot of funding. And with the contract that we have in place currently, mm -hmm. I doubt that we'll be able to get the federal funding that we need right. to add another route and an, another bus, mm -hmm. because it's paying for another driver, having another bus mm -hmm. available, and mm -hmm. uh, covering those hours. Mm -hmm. In terms of ridership, uh, we started the service. We actually started the service before the formal approval from the county board. I contacted the county executive and the representative from the county board to the uh, Rural Transit <coughs> Advisory Group, and they gave us the approval to start the service last Monday, uh, last week on Monday, because that was a request from the university because they needed to uh, bring people from the College of Engineering to the ICT, and they didn't have transportation, then they urged us to start the service. Sure. And last week, uh, the average uh, number of people from the university going to ICT was about six people. And usually we have four to five people riding the bus to go to Ratu in the morning. Then we still have a little bit of capacity considering that the process are 14. 14 people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we have in the contract that if the demand increases, we'll be able to provide another bus at the same time, but not beyond the regular, not beyond the regular hours that we currently have in place. Okay. Thank you. Rita, did they give you any numbers as to what they anticipate those numbers to be after uh, 2025? Uh, regarding the buses or regarding ridership, the buses? Ridership. Ridership. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. My guess is that because they are working on the, during summer, uh, they have a lot of interns working there. That's why they increase on ridership going there. Yeah. But my hope is because they are in the process of uh, building the autonomous vehicle track, right. then perhaps that ridership will increase. But we don't know. Yeah. Okay. We really don't know. Okay. They don't know. 
you know, the reason I was asking is because of the bus itself. If we need an increase mm -hmm. a number of buses to purchase, we need to get moving. Yeah, well, I'm working with Haida at this time uh, on getting, uh, for the good news is in 2019, we received approval for four buses okay. from a federal grant that we applied for. And I just contacted Haida last month knowing about this contract. And because the cost of the buses uh, increased significantly, it's mm -hmm. double the price that originally we had. We were able to get IDOT to increase the funding for the grant that we can still buy for buses. Okay. Um, the good thing is that IDOT is allowing us to uh, contact directly the uh, providers <coughs> of these buses, and we contacted them and explained the urgency that we have to get new buses. And as soon as the contract, we get the contract from IDOT executed, we'll be able to purchase the buses that they told us that they can deliver those buses to us between three to six months, which is huge, okay. considering that we're being ready for them for a more long Yes, time. exactly. Then hopefully this year we we'll have four new buses. Good, good. That'll hopefully. help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Next, I have here a piece of good news. At the end of April, we received an email from the U.S. Department of Transportation that notified us that we received a grant award for the Protect Discretionary Grant Program. Uh, we were one of the two recipients in the whole state. One from one, the other recipient was the Illinois Department of Transportation of and us. Uh, <laughs> the funding is, uh, to study the transportation infrastructure vulnerability uh, in Champaign County. And with that, our idea is to do an assessment and enhance accessibility and safety uh, looking at the climate changes that could happen in the future and how to adapt the existing transportation system to future damages that we may have. Uh, that's exciting uh, because we were one of the two in the whole state. Rita, was it IDOT District 1 that got the grant? Do you know the other? What it IDOT was the whole state. state. It was the central office. Right. It was the central office. It was in District 1. It was the central right. office. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, and this is for you, Christopher, <laughs> <laughs> last week, we submitted a Department of Energy concept paper, they call it, requesting funding <coughs> through the Department of Energy Electric Vehicle Charge Accelerator Grant Program. Uh, the funding that we are requesting is to develop an electric vehicle plan for Champaign County. Well, it's for the Champaign Urbana MPA area, but we also include San Joe and run to mm -hmm. within the application. Mm -hmm. Then uh, hopefully if we get the funding, we'll be able to do the assessment, uh, then have a plan in place for the whole community, mm -hmm. for the whole county, basically, this, including the uh, small communities, and then apply for funding for infrastructure. You have been asking for this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last item is, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but we have been providing uh, modeling support to the 16 uh, MPOs, Metropolitan Planning Organizations in the state since 2011. And uh, uh, I submitted a uh, renewal for that uh, project at the scope of services last month for uh, $500,000, basically around $500,000 to continue to provide the service, but expand the service also to other modeling tools and safety at the request of the other MPOs and uh, I received an email that that was approved for us. Then we'll be continuing to provide support for the other Illinois MPOs in the state. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, Justin, workforce development. <coughs> More than, um, uh, four quick announcements or updates. One is every year in workforce development, we have at least one major application window. 
at the time for young adults 18 to 24 or adults 18 plus to come and apply for participate in the workforce development program. That program is uh, not just choosing a training program, but exploring careers, exploring career skills, looking at the labor market, thinking about their skills and their interests, and then matching who they are, how much money they want to make, how long they want to be in school to local job opportunities. And if there's a good fit, we can enroll them with a career coach and then pay tuition books fees and coach them while they're in training. And so that happens at least once a year, and that application window is coming up in June. So then he's going to email you all a PDF. So if there's people you want to share it with, you have a PDF. You have a paper, paper version in your cap, in your, uh, you have a paper version. Um, but folks will need to come to Champaign or schedule a Zoom or a phone call to talk through. Uh, career exploration, so there's not an option just to apply to be in. You really need to talk through who are you, where are you going, what are you doing, this is the right time, what is this, so that you're a good fit and can be successful in school. And uh, the past couple of years, because of outreach we've done and support of partners, we've been successful in the application window. I don't see any areas of concern, but I'm just bringing it up to you all as this is the time to tell folks to come in if they don't come in during this application window, we have to run out of money because all the money is committed to both the people who've been in from the prior year and then <coughs> the new enrollees. So if you're going to school in the fall, now's the time to come because we not, don't always have money to go to school in the spring. Um, so the application window is opening up soon. Um, next update, something called good jobs. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, imagine uh, sometimes there's a low-income worker and one of the reasons, not always, but sometimes that they're unable to find success in the career is because maybe they don't advocate for themselves well or they just take the lowest paying job without benefits um, or they don't know how to set goals. Um, and sometimes workplaces lose employees and have turnover because they don't know how to invest in employees. Um, develop skills, have a safe culture, engage employees, etc. And then sometimes government and education and human service programs aren't successful with clients because you're just getting them through the program um, instead of um, helping the person learn how to advocate for themselves. So the, in my world of workforce development, those are called good jobs principles with workers, employers, and staff that you want to talk about recruitment and hiring and benefits and uh, diversity and equity and inclusion and empowerment and job security, culture, pay, skills and career advancement. Those are things that we know about and we've been doing locally for the since I got here because um, this is a passion of mine. Um, we were chosen as one of three local workforce areas in the state to do a good jobs pilot to develop a set of benchmarks and curriculum to share with the rest of the state. So for us, that's really exciting. So we'll be working on that for the next year, uh, along with the University of Illinois, uh, uh, trying to develop best practices and curriculum for other LWEAs about how to train staff, how to train job seekers, and how to, to train employers. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, those good jobs principles are in your, you provide a copy with those, and um, that's a, a partnership between uh, Illinois DCEO, Illinois Department of Labor, or U.S. Department <coughs> of Labor, and a couple of LWEs, so we're excited to work on that project. Uh, the third update is, <coughs> over the past couple of years, we tried <coughs> to work with the youth providers to engage the construction trades. Um, we didn't really have, especially to recruit under, from run, underrepresented populations, so yeah. black and brown folks, um, women, um, people from rural areas, um, etc., and we just couldn't get our youth providers to um, to fill that role. Um, and in our workforce board, and our youth committee, and our chief elected officials, we talked about it over the past couple of years. Maybe we need to transition and do some work in-house as RPC. And I've shared this update before. So this year, we did separate from some youth providers, and we started doing work in-house as RPC. And one of the first things we did was engage the union, say, I know you need help uh, recruiting from underrepresented populations. 
what do you have going on? <clears throat> and we talked it through in April, launched something in May to recruit and enroll in a pre-apprenticeship that starts in June. And uh, we were successful immediately, which we were really happy about because we mm -hmm. haven't done this before. <laughs> um, so we didn't fall on our face, which is always nice. And then um, it was a small uh, uh, pilot size, just six people, but four of the folks are black or mixed race, and two of them are from underrepresented populations. And um, we're just really excited to try and make a difference and to try and continue to help uh, folks in the workforce system uh, diversify their talent pipelines. And it was good to be able to support the unions, <coughs> something we've been working on for a couple mm -hmm. years and haven't been able to do so. To get a win was a good thing. Justin, just on that, yep. I met with Kevin Sage yesterday and he talked about what a great job and how easy you all made that uh, application process and then the referrals to the pre-apprenticeship program. So I just wanted to nice. uh, let you know that there's good, There's he's, he's saying good things out there yeah. about it, so that's good. That's great. Uh, and they actually have already started their classroom training and then, yeah. uh, so they, they he, was, he was very excited about the six candidates that they were able to secure, so mm -hmm. that's, it's a great job. That's good news. Yeah. The staff really pulled together and stepped up. One was new, the coordinator's never done this before, so trying to uh, get them to buy into the direction we wanted to go in was a good thing. And then I know that Parkland has a pre apprenticeship that's very mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. um, the only caveat there was they were at night and they wanted something during the day. Mm -hmm. So we can, but um, our intention is to continue to work with highway construction training program. Okay. Yeah. And it's a slightly different program. It's a very, it, it's different. <laughs> uh, much more intense, yeah. much more rigorous. Yeah where we are just providing uh, case management and recruitment and support services while the unions are doing a short-term 10-week. Right. So much more rigorous, but there's an ecosystem out here that we want to be aware of and support. So we recognize the work that Parkland's doing and, and are excited to continue to be a partner in that. Um, last um, update is um, since last fall, we were working on a local business service team. Alicia's been a part of that, so thank you. Um, we have. Um, the library and the SBDC and IDS and DHS and Parkland ourselves, there's 10 or 12 different organizations just talking about how to be more intentional about engaging employers. And I'll give a quick example, which is uh, Mr. Smith reached out and said, we have an industry in Rantoul, can you support it in some way? So I call Parkland and I talk to their VP, I talk to their dean, I call IDS, I get some CBOs. We go up there on a shared visit talk through how to work together, walk away, each of having something to do. And it's just, the local business service team is just about being more intentional about working together. So something doesn't stop at RPC or stop at Parkland or stop at the chamber, but we're always all thinking about each other. Um, that strategic planning's been going well. We have a planned launch for July, um, and we'll keep trying to think about how to support each other as a community, so I think it's been good. That's it for my updates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Tyler. Good morning, everyone. Um, a couple updates uh, for the, uh, we know we've been implementing, implementing a new timekeeping system with the UPH Rate Platform. Uh, we're currently working on a final payroll report that we need before we can launch the payroll process testing. Uh, once that report is complete, it should take two months to test the system and train staff to go live with that system. For the Sierra system, which internally tracks enrollments and programs across the RPC, we are currently working with Wahi and early childhood education staff on uh, to adjust the system to account for these different ways the programs uh, determine enrollment statuses. Um, once this is ready, we'll have uh, and we verified the data. We'll be able to share these uh, RPC enrollment geo mapping reports with the community. We are also currently working on assisting the early childhood division uh, in research and procurement of the uh, third-party uh, inventory management system. Um, our data specialist uh, has recently completed the housing inventory count for the uh, Community Services Division HMIS program. And we are, uh, we recently assisted the ICRT division in how to create uh, published training calendars that can be shared with different groups uh, for their weatherization training programs. Um, the data tech division is continuing to develop work on several grants for the planning community development division, including the Lincoln Avenue corridor study, long range transportation plan, equity housing and transportation grant project and we are preparing for the sidewalk data collection which should begin in the next two weeks um, 
We're also creating a grant-specific website for the PCB division that will outline all of their different grants, both current and past, and allow someone to easily search through and uh, become informed about all of those different grant projects. We are also making progress on our cloud migration of the internal PCD and administration applications to the uh, AKS or Azure Kubernetes Service Cloud Platform. Uh, we're on track to complete that migration by the end of June, and then we can begin work on updating the uh, PCD data models that are a part of that grant. And those are my updates. For you. Any questions? All right, thank you, Tyler. Um, and I believe we have Paul um, Francisco up there for our um, indoor climate research. Good morning, uh, thank Good morning. you, commissioners. I have just a, a um, couple of updates to share with you about ICRT. One, as Becky mentioned, we are in the process of interviewing candidates for a position. This is a new growth position that's not replacing somebody and uh, nobody left so it's a it's a growth of the program which i'm pleased about we would have completed first interviews by now one person had an overseas family emergency and so we'll complete first interviews on tuesday and then be doing second interviews in person first week of june so um, i am very confident that we will get a qualified candidate out of this search um, the other announcements for you, informational items, is that uh, you may recall that there were two substantial federal research projects that our group had had been um, successful in being awarded while we were still at the university, and those two were kind of the last remnants of the transition from the university to our <coughs> And just this week, the funds for both of those have been moved to RPC. So there's still a little paperwork that needs to be finished, but that is pretty much done. And we're now able to get our, the research team working on those. We are still waiting to hear on a couple of proposals that we have out there, but having those two get moved over to where we can really get going on them um, is, is a really, it's a big deal for the research team and for ICRT to be able to start to do that work and be bringing in those funds. Those two projects combined to be a little more than two and a half million dollars over a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Paul then? Mm -hmm. All right, um, Tammy. Um, I have uh, just one update in regards to uh, potential, or not potential, but personnel policy update that we will be bringing to you uh, related to the Paid Leave for All Workers Act. If you remember, you approved a tentative policy earlier this year in anticipation of the final rules being released, mm -hmm. and those have been released, so we are working with the state's attorney's office to uh, finalize that policy and then bring that back to you for approval to be incorporated into our personnel policy. Thank you. Any questions for Tammy then? <coughs> all right, if not, is there a motion to accept and place on file all the program division updates? Senator. Senator. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, <coughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed? All right, Delitzo, you have a report. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, <coughs> I have just a few items to report on first is to extend appreciation to the county board uh, last night uh, during their marathon uh, meeting approved uh, additional funding <laughs> 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 approved um, funding for uh, the RPC to use for a summer cooling program uh, as I've reported to you we ran out of LAHIP funds uh, sometime in, in April. The program was supposed to run through uh, the middle of August. Uh, we, uh, as well as other organizations across the state, currently have round of funding, but the county board approved uh, $100,000 out of ARPA funding uh, for us to use for a summer cooling program, which will go a long ways to assist uh, house, 
households that have individuals that have vulnerabilities. It could be seniors or individuals that are have disability or have children under the age of six. So uh, just want to publicly extend that appreciation to the county board. And I believe they also approved uh, funding for rental assistance. $50,000. $50,000 uh, for that as well. So um, I wanted to start off by extending that appreciation. The second part is uh, that um, I am and the two mayors here as well as uh, the village administrator of Savoy were part of a, a group called Champaign County First that went to Washington, D.C. to advocate for various uh, infrastructure, economic development uh, proposals that benefit our county as a whole. And um, some of those projects that we were there advocating uh, were submitted by Congresswoman Budzinski for consideration for funding. So it's great to see that um, um, you know, within a week or so of returning from Washington, D.C., she did contact uh, various members of our group, letting them know that their projects had been submitted for consideration for funding. The s uh, third item I wanted to report to you on is that um, this is the 60th uh, anniversary of the Economic Opportunity Act. So the Economic Opportunity Act uh, was part of the Great Society, um, so various provisions under President Lyndon Johnson, but the Economic Opportunity Act was um, I intended to launch the war against poverty. Uh, we as the RPC, we are also a community action agency, uh, and we are one of 1,100 community action agencies across the country that are federally designated to address poverty at the local level. We as Community Action uh, have a presence in, here in Illinois in all one, 102 counties of the state. And 99% um, of the counties in the United States have, are served by a Community Action Agency. Um, we also have a presence in uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So we have quite a bit of a presence. And Community Action programs are primarily in Lisa Benson's division, but I'll say that had RPC not become a community action agency, which we became one in the early 80s, uh, we would not have Head Start. Uh, Head Start used to be operated by the community action agency that's in uh, Danville, and at the time that they decided, and they were operating it here in Champaign, but when they decided to uh, give up that portion of their Head Start program, they approached the RPC because we were a community action agency. Same thing with uh, LIHEAP and weatherization. Um, you know, those two programs used to be uh, operated by the uh, Urban League, and, um, but when the, the state uh, decided to make a change, they approached the RPC because the RPC was a community action agency. So that designation has a lot of value for us as an organization. Um, I do want to read just a part of the speech from President Lyndon Baines Johnson when he declared the war on poverty on January 8, 1964. And he said, this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. I urge this Congress and all Americans to join me in the effort. Poverty is a national problem requir requiring improved national organization and support. But this attack, to be effective, must also be organized at the state and local level. For the war against poverty will not be won here in Washington. It must be won in the field and in every private home, in every public office, from the courthouse to the White House. Very often, a lack of jobs and money is not the cause of poverty, but the symptom. Our aim is not only to relieve the symptoms of poverty, but to cure it, and above all, to prevent it. No single piece of legislation, however, is going to suffice. And so um, later on that year, on August 20th, 1964, uh, the Economic Opportunity Act was signed into law, mm -hmm. and uh, that launched the work that uh, we have been engaged in, at least RPC, since the early 80s, but a lot of organizations uh, engaged in that since uh, 1964. Head Start uh, next year will be celebrating 60 years uh, of existence, uh, and I'm sure there will be more information that will be shared 
with the uh, uh, community as well as with the commission. I am humbled uh, to be the chair of both the state organization, which has close to 40 uh, organizations, as well as the national chair for community action, which has the 1,100 agencies that I mentioned. And so uh, throughout this year, we've been having a lot of various events, which will culminate in uh, Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, this August, uh, where we are expecting actually uh, one of the daughters of uh, President Johnson uh, to attend uh, that event. Um, the other thing, last thing I want to report on, and I've been providing you with these updates, but I wanted to publicly thank our elected officials, both uh, Representative Carol Emmons, as, as well as Senator Paul Faraci, uh, for working together uh, to advance pieces of legislation that have critical importance to the work that we do as the Regional Planning Commission. First being the uh, LAHI bill, which I had shared with you uh, in previous meetings, House Bill 4471, which uh, will help to extend the state uh, supplemental fund for LAHI. So we, as I've said before, we have two sources of funding. We have federal funding and we have state funding, which is uh, comes from uh, surcharge that our regulated utilities assess on their customers. That statute that enables that uh, was uh, going to sunset January 1st, 2025, which essentially would have eliminated about 45% of the funding that is used to serve households with utility assistance. And so when I had a conversation with Representative Ammons back in January, she did not hesitate uh, and, and filed the bill in January, and it went through the process. Uh, as I've reported to you, unanimously passed uh, uh, in the House, and then in the Senate, I uh, spoke to uh, Senator Paul Faraci, and he took it on, and it unanimously passed in, in the Senate as well. Um, it hasn't been sent to the governor yet, uh, but once it, it is sent, um, we will reach out to um, uh, Andy Menar, who's one of the deputy governors over economic development in the governor's office, to make sure that uh, there are no, no issues, if there are any questions. We have done a uh, press release that uh, did have quotes from both uh, Representative Emmons as well as Senator Paul Faraci. We've gotten some uh, media coverage over this. In fact, WCIA uh, did a story on the importance of this uh, sunset clause being removed out of the statute. And uh, they actually interviewed Senator Faraci uh, at the Capitol. Uh, um, and I don't think they were able to get a hold of Representative Ammons because the House was in session uh, when they did the interview. And so, um, so we're very happy that this is not only benefits RPC, but this benefits uh, the entire state, uh, households throughout the entire state of Illinois that will benefit from this part of the funding continuing on beyond uh, January 1st, 2025. The second one is uh, obviously another one that I've also shared is Senate Bill 691, which um, will, uh, once it's signed into law, will allow regional planning commissions to be able to um, finance and be able to purchase uh, property. There are about maybe 18 regional planning commissions throughout the state. And um, unfortunately, this statute uh, only allowed one regional planning commission, which I think is out of Peoria. Um, but uh, this legislation, which also unanimously passed both chambers, um, uh, will allow all regional planning commissions the opportunity or the ability to be able to acquire property. Uh, that comes with. Uh, uh, at a critical time for us as, a, as an organization, as we are in the process of looking for uh, an administrative home for the Regional Planning Commission. And so we're hopeful that the governor will sign this and it will become, um, become law, and then we can proceed accordingly in as far as searching for uh, space. Um, so again, I want to thank them both uh, for working together and working with the RPC uh, to advance these two pieces of legislation uh, on our behalf. Uh, with that, I will uh, end my report there, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Thank you. So
I see no old business on our agenda. Does anyone have any that needs to be brought up? If not, we'll move on to our new business. Um, I'll have Tammy kind of lead into this, uh, a little bit dis discussion as far as the packets and what we need to do to proceed. So you have a packet that includes several sets of closed session minutes, and uh, we've been working with the state's attorney's office on this. Um, the chair has a letter from the state's attorney's office uh, regarding the semi-annual review of closed session minutes. Um, but first, we need to approve 10 sets of closed session minutes that have not been formally approved yet in an open session meeting. So um, there's a memo that is in your packet that identifies the dates of those meetings. And then the second part of this is um, undertake the semi-annual review of closed session minutes, which is required by Illinois statute. So the state's attorney's office has recommended six sets of minutes uh, that go back as far as 1998 to be released. And the basis of that is a resolution that um, was approved by the county board that basically establishes parameters for when closed session minutes um, are recommended to be released to the public. So um, after the analysis was completed by the state's attorney's office, there were six sets of minutes that they are saying are um, eligible to be released. Of course, that's up to the commissioners whether they do or do not want to release those. That's uh, your decision. Uh, but the recommendation is that there are six sets that can be released to the public um, based on the resolution. So I would just ask that um, we would take action to approve the minutes that have not yet been approved and then um, go through the process of um, the semi-annual review and whatever the pleasure of the commissioners is regarding those minutes. Thank you. Is there any questions for Tammy? Um, if not, has everyone had a chance to kind of quickly review through the packet? So if everyone has done that, I forgot to print it off, so I'll have to read it off on my phone here, the dates. Um, so first thing we will need, we'll need a motion to um, approve the closed session minutes of December 29th, 2020, January 6th, 2021, January 22nd, 2021, mm -hmm. November 19th, 2021, February 25th, 2022, October 28th, 2022, November 28th, 2022, October 18th, 2023, October 27th, 2023, and March 22nd, 2024. So moved. Second, Michaels. Okay. Um, any discussion, if not? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carried. Uh, the second motion that we'll need is to um, go upon the recommendation of the state's attorney's office to um, allow to be open closed session um, minutes of January, or I'm sorry, July 17th, 1998, September 28th, 20, um, I'm sorry, 2007, October 9th, 2007, October 12th, 2007, October 28th, uh, 2011, and May 31st, 2016. So moved. Was there a second? All second. Okay. All right. Any discussion or questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries. Um, please remember to initial your packets and hand them back to Debbie. Um, with that being said, um, that concludes our meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? Thank you. Have a good holiday weekend.